uh, Debbie, what do you think has brought on this coup? Uh, we were seeing an economic crisis in Burma because of COVID and how the government, including the military authorities, uh, mismanaged it. And we saw a rise in um, armed conflicts and uh, military attacking civilian communities. We saw uh, attacks happening in 10 out of the 14 states and regions of the country during 2020. So um, that's always a recipe for disaster. But what really gave the military a headache was that the National League for Democracy led by Aung San Suu Kyi had a huge landslide victory in the November 2020 general elections. Despite um, so many barriers and the uh, voting um, banned uh, in, in many ethnic areas, the NLD won a second term um, very, very convincingly in a very compelling way. And that would have meant that the NLD would have been emboldened to take stronger action on reforms in the country. And um, that would have been quite un intolerable for the military. But of course, there's always a personal motive. The commander in chief, Senior General Min Aung Lai, who is the main person responsible for the Rohingya genocide, um, was due to retire um, in the middle of this year. He would no longer be eligible to lead the armed forces. And, um, uh, and he, would, uh, he would lose complete control and complete power. So I think um, it, it became quite clear that he had needed to find a way to seize power. And they took the Trump route. They um, claimed that uh, there was a, a, a massive voter fraud and there had been 10 million uh, unlawful votes, et cetera, et cetera. And then after that, um, backed it up with, um, with, with basically uh, the army, with army action to, uh, to ad arrest Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, president, the president and um, uh, members of parliament and, uh, and, and basically seize power, which they are empowered to do under the military drafted constitution of 2008. So, all, all the things that human rights activists warned about from the very beginning came to pass in a very terrible way. Uh, Monday was supposed to be the first day of the new uh, of the parliament where they would choose the new uh, president and vice presidents. Um, and April would have been the official start date for the new government to take over. Um, all of that was put by the wayside, but um, amidst all of this, it's important to recognize that the civilians, the Rohingya, the Karen, the Kachin, the Shan, uh, the Chin, um, the Kareni, all these people who have been subjected to armed attacks by the military in the past year are now even more vulnerable. Uh, in, in Rakhine State, both the Rohingya and the Rakhine are under, under attack by the Tatmadaw. So um, it is unlikely that uh, ethnic minorities already under attack from the military are going to have a better time of it in this uh, under a military junta. How, how, do, you, um, how do you assess the experience of the last five years. I don't know whether you can really call it power sharing, but um, how do you assess the impact of those, uh, those five years on uh, what will happen now in terms of popular response against this coup and also in terms of the international response? Because of course, Aung San Suu Kyi's standing uh, on the international level has um, taken quite a battering. Well, you know, Aung San Suu Kyi, in the past five years, the NLD government led by Aung San Suu Kyi uh, didn't rock the boat. In fact, they tried to um, find ways to get along with the military and convince the military that a civilian government led by the NLD was an important ally. 
And um, many, um, many human rights activists feel that a lot of wasted opportunity, there were a lot of wasted opportunities. Um, and um, and there's still, we still have this problem of arbitrary detention, land grabbing, armed conflict. You know, the military gained um, 170% increase in its budget since Burma um, nominally moved into a civilian um, democratic government since 2011. And with that huge amount of money, they didn't use it for human rights trainings. They use it to attack more people and create more conflict, which is why we've the 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 number of conflicts targeting civilians, the number of attacks targeting civilians or harming civilians rose by 270% at the and during that that same period. Now, um, you know, it's been a mixed bag. A lot of people had enjoyed greater political space. Um, there was opportunities for people to have meetings, workshops, etc. But um, even then, there were always going to be, um, uh, there were always some type of restriction or, or condition imposed on them. So, you know, we weren't, it, the last five years weren't actually some glorious era of democratization in Burma. It was, there were still so many fundamental challenges, not to mention the Rohingya genocide. So I think um, uh, the, the expectation at that time was somehow the NLD and the military would find a way to get along. Compromises would be made, but the, the, broader, um, the broader sense of a stable economic development would be achieved, which is why this is um, quite shocking. Although we all, we all warned that the constitution itself enabled the commander in chief to grab power at, for no apparent reason, for any reason really. Um, the, there was also an assumption that the military and their families and their cronies were too addicted to foreign investment and being part of the international community to take any drastic action like this. But now, what we see since February 11, the early hours of February, sorry, now what we see since the early hours of February the 1st on Monday is that this was a very well-planned operation. Um, we think that at the end of this, about a thousand, up to a thousand, a thousand and sixty-four members of parliament who were not, who are not aligned with the military are likely to have been subjected to some type of arbitrary detention, interrogation, and house arrest. Um, it is uh, very possible that the senior leaders of the National League for Democracy will be targeted for harsher treatment. But also, um, what is our main concern is for human rights defenders from all backgrounds, Burman and ethnic and other ethnic groups, um, especially young people are going to be targeted quietly and viciously. And um, we are also seeing a rise of uh, a mob of mob rule where the military uses um, so-called mass movements, but essentially people who are paid uh, to support the military and to attack their critics. So it gives the, the military and the armed forces some measure of deniability to say, oh, these are just random people who love their country and love the military coming after you, it's not us. So we, we are likely to see all of those um, situ all of those developments happening if they have not happened already. But also there's this idea, I mean, the military, General, General Min Online took the Trump, took a, a card out of uh, Trump's book and, and used this, uh, used fake news and disinformation and fear mongering via social media to claim that there was a 10 million election fraud. Um, but the difference with, between him and Trump is that he had an entire army at his disposal. But I think also the um, senior general Min Aung is also um, playing poker with the international community. They're taking a gamble that um, 
they promised just to have a caretaker military junta for a year and have fresh elections and people are not going to jail they're going to go under house arrest everyone will start getting used to being back under a military regime and then they will extend that period um, and start and also use the time to whittle away at whatever little reforms that were made. This is really, really dangerous because there's so much pressure now to basically start up a fire sale of the, co the country's natural resources in order to win back what, was, what, is, what is being lost because of COVID. And that also means that people are at risk of um, increased threats to their livelihood being forcibly displaced. And, and because the borders are so tightly controlled because of COVID, there will be nowhere for refugees to run. It's interesting that you mentioned this, um, the military playing chicken with the West. Um, in Australia, for instance, uh, calls for uh, the uh, military cooperation with, uh, with, with, with uh, Mayama to be uh, stopped or suspended have been met with unofficial messaging from the government that uh, this could be a dangerous thing because it will push, it could push uh, Myama closer to China. So everything is within this framework of, you know, China, China's growing influence in the region. Um, how do you, how, what, what do you think about this military cooperation? Should it end? And, uh, and, and also, what about this, this China card, which seems to be uh, in the game somehow? Everyone is using the China card to maintain the status quo. And let me be frank here. The ASEAN and the international community uh, engaged with the military regime in its earlier incarnation in the 80s and the 90s saying, oh, if it's not us, then China will get in. Well, China got in anyway. China got in anyway. And not only that, China, um, uh, China corrupted the system even further because countries like Australia just kept their mouths shut and just wanted to engage for engagement's sake. Like, you know, um, it's quite illogical at this point to say, oh, yeah, we've got to go along with the coup because we don't want China to have too much influence. Why do you think the military had a coup? Because they, have very conf they were very confident that China would back them up. So we have to actually do whatever we can. Uh, we need to act comprehensively to go after the military's interests, whether it's military, whether it's the general's children studying in Australia, whether it's the military's family or military themselves coming for medical treatment or a shopping trip in Australia, I'm sorry, it's time to take a stand. And you know what? The reality is that the more, the longer you allow this military re regime to stay in power, the more it will produce uh, refugees and displaced persons. And I know how the Morrison government is so allergic to refugees and asylum seekers. If they don't give a damn about human rights, it's time for them to understand what are the consequences on Australia and on regional se human security if you let if you don't you let you let this coup pass. The General Min Online is hoping that they will be treated the same as Thailand when Thailand had their coup. A few statements of concern or condemnation, then back to business as usual. And uh, and eventually uh, he can become president either elected or unelected. That's the that's the scenario. But what's different now? from 10 years ago is that people in the military, the military class have gotten used to being able to travel, to shop, to study overseas. They, they, they need to feel some pain. They need to understand that their wealth is at stake. And this is something that's fundamentally important. We need to get um, countries like Australia saying, 
this is an urgent matter that needs to be raised at this UN Security Council. This has happened and China's blocked it. But do you think China will keep protecting the regime? No, eventually it's going to get tired of it because they've got other fish to fry. So it's about being persistent. It's about being consistent. And it's about thinking strategically and logically. Just, you know, having this very weak, spineless excuse like, oh, we can't do it, you know, because of China. Yeah, all right. Everything is because of China. China is the reason not to act. Um, and that's just not good enough. That, that is a weak excuse. And it's, it's a weak excuse coming from people who are with very weak principles. Would you, from what you said, um, the, the military still has a big economic weight or, or stake uh, in, in, in the, you know, in the economy. And would you say this has been, has grown in the last five years, over the last five years, or has it been uh, reduced? Is there, has there actually been a reduction in, in, the, in the real day-to-day -day power and weight of the military in Burmese society? The, some of the largest um, national corporations in the country are either controlled um, by military or former military or are, uh, are partially owned or provide profits for the military and their families. The reason the military is grabbing power is they have they want to regain economic control of the country. The UN fact-finding mission already um, highlighted that the number of military-owned and military-linked companies, and this is something that no, most of the international community were reluctant to deal with. But we should be sanctioning the pants of these corporations. We should be ensuring that Australian companies and Australian supply chains don't go, don't touch uh, any of these corporations because we that would be contributing directly and indirectly, not only to genocide, but also to serious crimes and war crimes happening all around the country. So I think, um, you know, we, we, we also need to understand that Australian corporations and the Australian government has obligations, not just under human rights treaties, but under the OECD guidelines for responsible business conduct and the UN guiding principles for business and human rights, etc. that they have to start cleaning up their act or risk later down the track being sued or subjected to um, legal action for failing to disengage themselves from these business organizations. Actually, if the international community had worked harder to help dismantle and weaken these uh, military economic institutions, then perhaps the military wouldn't be in such a in field that they need to have a coup. Last night's uh, international news coverage um, said that the streets were, had, were very calm and that um, life seemed to be returning to normal. Are you surprised by this and, or do you think this is um, a calm before the storm? Is there going to be some sort of, do you anticipate um, a, a mass response sometime soon? I think um, you know there's this uh, there's a, a mainstream media narrative that the people of Burma are helpless, um, they are fatalistic, that they won't do anything, and let, let let's not forget this history of this country has featured many bloody crackdowns because people refused to give in. Now last night. Uh, households start, uh, went out um, into their yards or into their balconies and banged pots at 8 p.m. And 8 p.m. is the national news. So they were banging pots um, in protest. And this is reminiscent of other movements around the world, including in Turkey, where at an appointed time, people stood out in front of their houses and banged pots in protest. Now, um, 
there are a huge number of really courageous activists who are out there documenting what is happening and finding ways and means to get it out to the outside world. None of this, you know, there's no more flights going in and out of Burma, not just domestic, not just international, but uh, domestic flights either. People are being forced to stay in place, so international media can't get in. And it's the local activists who are getting the news out and um, get, keeping people informed. There's, they've started a civil disobedience movement and this is a very interesting intergenerational um, process. We're seeing a lot of young people getting very outraged and using social media for this purpose, even though they've been warned by the authorities. So, you know, the, the thing is that um, we can't expect immediately for people to go out in the streets because they know very well, this is a brutal military regime the streets of Rangoon, Mandalay, and, and Nepido have been bristling with, um, with military checkpoints for the past, for days before the actual coup. So people are not likely to just go out and, and have a confrontation knowing that they're likely to be killed on the spot. So I think um, groups are, groups have, um, uh, groups have mobilized they're working underground, they're working discreetly, they're trying to uh, do whatever's necessary, and we will really see the resistance um, come out in the weeks ahead. The resistance has already started, and it started not just with our hardcore activists on the ground, it started with ordinary people who are really angry about what's happened. Thank you, Debbie, for your insights and also for your years of consistent hard work for uh, human rights.